primarily the Piscataway and the Anacostic. Um, yeah, I'm Director of Business Development at Leadership. Um, and I have my own little consulting group, um, One Better World LLC. And actually, I'm coming to you. I just actually was on a webinar that I had to do for, um, what is it called? Um, Student Affairs Now. Um, we're doing a 25 years of SJTI, the Social Justice Training Institute. And so I left them to pop over here um, to be with you. So happy to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you all for joining. It's great to see where you're joining us from all over the country, hopefully experiencing some good weather along along the way. So as we, um, yes, absolutely. Congratulations on the anniversary of SJTI. It's awesome. It's so wonderful. So we are all pretty familiar with the Zoom, the Zoom platform. Uh, we will use this platform to engage in conversation here this afternoon. Please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat as Vernon and I are talking. We want to make sure that we are engaging with you all in these conversations. And um, if, if time allows, Absolutely, we'll have people come off mute and actually have a conversation yeah. with that uh, via words in your voice if that if that works best for you all as well. As we get started in our time together this afternoon, I uh, want to just offer this land acknowledgement. Many of you may have your own land acknowledgements in the organizations that you're a part of, uh, but this is one that we use here at Leadership, uh, specifically when we're thinking about how we're entering into these Zoom spaces and how we're all coming from different different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and just beginning to think about and giving time and honor to those who came before us uh, and the what they did and the labor they had for us to be in the places that we're at today. So I ask you to just pause and to think about that for, from wherever you are joining us from. For those of you who uh, may be new to leadership in, uh, in our conversation series, uh, a little bit about leadership. We are a not-for-profit organization that partners with colleges and universities and like-minded organizations uh, to execute this vision and to really begin to think about what the world would be like if it were a more just, caring, and thriving place where all led with integrity and practice a healthy disregard for the impossible. Uh, we do that through programming and partnerships uh, and conversations such as these. Uh, we believe we don't yet live in that world. And one day when we do, and we won't need to gather in these conversations because they will just be a part of our everyday. But until then, uh, we want to keep engaging and work to make this world uh, a better place for all of us to, to live, to work, and to thrive. So here we are. This is our conversation today, uh, our philosophy on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I'm really excited that you all are, are willing to join us for this conversation. It's a conversation Vernon and I and the rest of the staff have been having always. I, right, I don't know. They can't put a time frame to it. But specifically, as we think about, you know, the last six to eight months um, and, you know, the landscape of, and maybe not even six to eight months, probably the last two to three years. I don't know. It's just an ongoing conversation um, that that we've been having, and, and we're glad to bring you in on that conversation because we're never finished with it. Um, it's We're never at an ending point in this conversation. We are continuing to learn and to grow. And um, I think when we think about this work of the diversity, equity, inclusion work that we do and that all of us do, uh, it is really foundational to being, being able to do leadership work. Um, I can't separate the two and leadership can't either um, in the work that we do. And so um, as we're talking about these things, know that those two things are connected for us uh, as we view and, and where we enter into this conversation. Vernon, anything that you want to add before we get started, just as we are thinking about the overview of our topic? Well, I was thinking about, um, as you were Kristen, the, um, the founders of leadership um, in the 1980s were rebels. Um, mm -hmm. I really do believe that in their time. They basically said, if you think about the, the conversations around leadership, they were typically focused on positional leadership, very hierarchical, mm -hmm. very male-centered. Um, and there was this sort of interesting narrative around how do we do this in a way that's more around relationship, which led them to thinking about ways at that time to talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, and I believe that some of the things that they did initially really allowed for us yeah. to build today. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great framework. And I, 
you know, as, as you, wherever you all are joining us from, whatever offices you might be a part of, I'd ask you to kind of think about that as well, right? Yeah. We all have a story of people that came before us. We, we talk about this in our land acknowledgement and, um, you know, yes, their language might've been different. Their intent might've been different, but are, were they doing some of the same work that we're doing here today? Um, and that hopefully people will continue on doing long after we all have, have left these roles um, in these organizations. So when we think about our work related to diversity, equity, inclusion, the first thing that I think about is how we enter into this conversation. And I really, I want to share with you all our leadership values that really ground our work and ground us as we engage in, in these conversations. Um, and when I think about that, so our first value that I'll talk a little bit about is hope. Um, you know, when we think about the value of hope, we recognize that there are hardships in the world, there's tragedy, there is an equity, um, and, and we believe it can be better. We believe that suffering can be removed and can be lessened, and that it's hope that gives us that. It's hope that, um, that helps us to see that, um, and we see that connected to our next value of community. Um, we see that hope because we see the people who are connected in community to each other, um, whether that be students that we work with, facilitators that we work with, members of our own communities as well. Um, we know and believe that we need each other, um, that I am better because of Vernon. And, I, and, and Vernon believes that he's better because of me, because we each offer something that the other does not in community with each other. And so uh, we recognize the importance of that community. We recognize the importance of individuals contributing their gifts, their talents, their brilliance, and their struggles. Um, so not that community is a place where everything's always happy-go-lucky, right? We contribute all of who we are to the spaces that we're a part of, and that that frame also guides the work that we do. Um, and it's that hope and community that then leads to transformation. And you all see this on your own campuses and the organizations that you're a part of, uh, whether it be on um, large scale, issues and, and struggles that people are facing or small minor things that people might be uh, struggling with, we see change, right? Whether it's change in a policy, whether it's change in signage on a campus, whether it's change in coursework, right? Whatever that change might be, we, we see that transformation. We believe that. At Leadership, we see that all the time. It's grounded in the work that we do in, in the Leadership Institute. We ask students to think about and create a vision for something they care about, um, we believe we, when you create a vision for something, you believe in the power of transformation. We believe that that's possible. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that transformation, we really believe in possibility. Um, and I think very often when we look in the world around us, we don't embrace that possibility mindset. We come with a negative deficit mindset. And if you want to join us tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, that possibility mindset and what that means to, to leadership and what we think it means to leadership education. But possibility and transformation for us are very linked um, in our value statement, in our, in our values. Um, and then the final piece that guides our work is courage. Um, none of this is easy, right? Whether it's a conversation that I need to have with a colleague, whether it's a conversation I need to have with a family member, um, it's, it cannot be, it may not be easy, but it's necessary. Um, and the work that we do in the areas around leadership development and diversity and equity and inclusion is necessary. Um, we need to be having those conversations. And so um, we also, understanding the necessity of that, understand that for each of us, it might take a courage looks different and we'll be asked to use our courage in different ways at different times. Um, what it, what what means, what I need to have courage about in a conversation is gonna look different than what Dave needs to have courage about in a conversation or Vernon needs to have courage about in a conversation. But I recognize the courage I see in others. And I think that's important when we think about the values that guide our work is that we also recognize that in others and we are there to support that. Um, and we're there to just support that that courage and the action upon that courage goes to create change both personally, uh, interpersonally, and then systemically as well. And so I share all of those to, to share with you. Those are the values that have guided our work at Leadership, uh, not only in diversity, equity, inclusion, I would say across the board in all that we do. So I, as you hear me talk about these, know that we're focusing specifically on this one topic, but anytime we get together as an organization, we think about these four values and what impact they have in the conversation. And, you know, I think that's as we continue talking this afternoon, I think that's important to to if you're thinking about how do you have conversations around DEI work, 
Think about how you approach conversations around other work as well and use those same practices so that it's not just I enter into this space grounded in my values when I'm talking about diversity, equity, inclusion work, but I'm entering into this space using my values when I talk about community building, when I'm talking about policy making, all of those things that I'm, I'm grounded in and rooted in my values. Um, and I'm sure that's not a surprise to those of you who have taught some leadership curriculum that we're going to emphasize that values work be at the, the forefront and the foundation of your conversations. So with that, then, as our at, at the foundation of our conversations, then is the, how do we define leadership? And and I mentioned it earlier, you know, we really do believe that the work of diversity, equity, inclusion and the work of leadership it, are linked together, um, just as, you know, as Vernon mentioned at the beginning, we our founders definitely didn't think that that was what they were doing, but it was what they were doing. Um, and it is what we continue to do because this is what we believe about leadership. Uh, there you go. We believe leadership is the practice of co-creating a more just, caring, and thriving world through living uniquely with integrity. Um, in this, we recognize that everyone is the expert of their own experience. And when they bring their expertise into that experience, they can co-create something that is transformative, um, that uses, that becomes leadership. Um, and that those two pieces, our values and this leadership definition really ground how we think about this work that we're doing in DEI. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Vernon and um, we'll talk a little bit more about then what else influences us outside of the things that we hold internal in our values and our guiding principles and guiding practices, what else is influence us, influencing us in the conversation? Thanks, Kristen. Yep. So this is a dynamic slide. I, di I didn't warn you. Um, okay. You tell me when to press the button then. I'll keep pressing it. Yeah, keep pressing it. Um, so I, I, when I do presentations specifically for um, faculty, staff, um, also to folks who um, are nonprofit and corporate, and I do this work specifically in higher education. Let's talk higher education right now. I show this headline from the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, War, Political Frustration, Race student unrest, war, political frustration, race, student unrest. If you look very closely to that date, it's September 2nd, 1968. September 2nd, 1968. I share this because in the higher education, we have selective memory. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a campus and some well-meaning white person usually in student affairs will come up to me and go, Vernon, isn't it the worst it's ever been in the history of higher education for people from marginalized identities? I'm like, well, you know, we had slavery. Um, you know, that was kind of bad. Um, you know, did have internment camps for um, um, Japanese Americans and, oh, you know, anti-Asian violence. Can we talk about murdering trans people? I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's not new. It's just being, it's just being filmed. We know about it. Um, and it's so important for us to know that, yes, the context of the United States right now is different and fueled by social media, um, the rapid fire of 24 hour news channels. We know about it more. Um, my mother, I was at home recently and my mother and I were, my mom and dad were both teachers. Um, and so having conversations about current events was always a part of our life at the dinner table. We couldn't leave the dinner table until we had a conversation about some current issue. And I remember thinking about it when I was younger going, oh, here we go again. And now looking back on it, what a great, opportunity for us to engage in those conversations. And just recently, my mother, I was a little frustrated about just some misinformation that was on the news. Um, and my mother goes, do you remember Uncle Jim? And I said, Uncle Jim? She said, I said, Uncle Jim, he used to come to our cookouts on July 4th. And she said, yes. Do you remember what would happen when Uncle Jim would be there after about an hour? I'm like, I don't. She goes, Uncle Jim would sit all the children around and he would tell a story. And the story was that, I want you to know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was not assassinated. He was actually rescued at the last minute by Black Panthers, who um, will, in the year 1982, release him to be able to save our country and take us all to the promised land. And I remember as a 10 year old, I looked over at my mother and she goes, absolutely. <laughs> she was like, don't. And, and then she goes, now, Fast forward to today, 
Uncle Jim has Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. There's a lot of Uncle Jims out there. And I went, oh my God. Because Uncle Jim would only tell that story once a year on July 4th to a group of children. Now Uncle Jim is telling those stories to hundreds of thousands of people and finding support. And so that is really what we need to be thinking about is like, we have always been, there's always been resistance to issues of inclusion in our world and in our country. It's just repackaged in a different way now and we will continue to navigate that. And that's what we do. I love to have some photos. And so um, just to kind of give us some context of some of the things that are happening, um, just a few of the things that are happening now in our world and our country. Um, and knowing that, um, you know, I love that quote that we, many of us know from Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It always does. And so this is not about toxic positivity. This is about critical hope and the fact that we are a part of this and what we can do to do that and be a part of that. So we know that you've all seen um, several studies that talk about um, how people are reacting and feeling about what's happening in our world and our country. You know, just two things, you know, 20, you know, 2021, 26% uh, 26 of college students said that they think their schools need to develop strategies regarding on-campus DEI. 2022, um, you know, 62% of prospective students and current students said that they believed racial and ethnic diversity improves the experience of college. I was so lucky to, I don't know if any of you saw um, Dr. Sean Harper's um, webinar. You can go to his website if you get a moment. Um, right after the um, Supreme Court announced their decision around affirmative action um, and admissions, um, Sean did this wonderful, wonderful webinar where he talked about the implications of higher education. And he said something that really stuck with me. And he said, typically when we see legislation like this, we focus on the marginalized identity in terms of how they will be impacted by this decision, which is very important. However, he said, we lose sight of the fact that the people who will lose the most if we continue to not have these conversations are people from privileged identities because we're not preparing them for the workforce that is to be in five, 10, 20 years and currently. So they're gonna be deficit in, in, in all areas of um, work because they're not gonna be able to work with people who are different from them or who've come from different backgrounds. And that was so, so powerful to hear because I was doing the same thing that we all do. We think about, the margin, our marginalized identity groups in terms of, oh my gosh, how is this going to affect it? He said, no, 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 we need to also talk about the fact that this is all of us, all of us together. We talked about, um, you know, the Supreme Court decision. I, I do want to mention that it's really important for us to, to deep dive when we get a moment into a lot of this, um, a lot of the headlines. So for instance, the Supreme Court decision, as most Supreme Court decisions are, is a very narrow decision on admissions and race. And to apply it to anything else um, does not serve us. We do know that um, legal counsels on college and universities will attempt to do that, but we need to push back and say, hold on, this is what the actual decision says. Similar to the 70 pieces of legislation that is currently threatening, DEI work, it is frightening, absolutely. And redefine print. Most of them have been thrown out when they've gotten to federal courts. Only four states now currently have DEI, anti-DEI legislation that was signed by a governor. So you've got the rhetoric and then you've got the actual statistics. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned. I'm just saying, we do have in a democracy a process for us to really and truly be about equity. And the difficulty in a, in a democracy is it takes a long time for things to happen in ways that we would want them to in terms of equity and inclusion. So while I wanna say it's important just to know there is a culture right now of fear and you basic, in my mind, you, you basically confront fear with information. 
Um, and that's what we need to continue to do. So we wanna ask you to, in the chat, um, what have you been noticing um, in your campus, in your communities, um, in your place of work? It can be about students, it can be about the national landscape, whatever is on your mind now, we just want there to be an opportunity for you to tell us um, specifically around equity and inclusion. Um, it can be about students, it can be about faculty and staff, it can be about community members, whatever your context is. Um, what are some things you're concerned about or you're noticing or something that may be um, something positive um, that you're, whatever it can be, whatever is on your mind. Let's get a few of these in the chat and see what we got. Well, people are typing, Vernon, I think that the next person to do a webinar should be your mother. <laughs> you know, she does come up with some pretty um good nuggets of wisdom pretty regularly. She does. Uh, I mean, I feel like I have learned a lot through you from her. So I think that we should we should work on that. Yeah, she's a force to be working with. She she told me she wanted to come to one of my sessions one time. And I said, absolutely not. You're not coming. I think she should. I no, think she you can't you can't do that. Um yeah, she's I think too, um, you know, I I do want to make sure that I mention that I don't want to, when I say we've been here before, I don't want to diminish the hurt, pain, anger, and frustration that folks are feeling on campuses in their communities, because it is scary to see it happening and see it unfold. I'm adding to that that we've been here before and we will we we'll we'll get through it. Um, yeah. So let's see what we got. Yep, stopping programs. Um, yeah, eliminating DEI roles, absolutely. Cutting budgets. Um, I just read some things in the Chronicle today about budgets being cut. Um, a, a hesitation. Absolutely. Around, well, let's not bring any attention on us as an institution, as a department, given the political climate. Let's just kind of um, keep a low profile. Yep. DI offices being dismantled, um, services being watered down and defunded. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Sort of definitely the resistance is happening. Um, Yep, yep, yep. Cool. Thank you. Feel free to continue to add things in there. Um, I think that um, you know, it's it's hard right now, I think, to 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 have some sort of um energy around this work. It's it can be um overwhelming um as we continue to see the headlines and continue to see the things that were out there. Oh. Programs and um, at, for conferences are being flagged as being maybe a little too controversial. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. I, I do agree, Dave, that I do see the incoming classes being much more open to connect and share when given up. I I see that. I have not. I have been doing this work for a pretty long time, and I when I'm on campuses, these students I always leave going, "We're fine," you know. These students are amazing. They were doing great work. It's just some of the times the leadership is just so, so frustrating. Um, I, I do sessions for students all the time and I love it. Get me in a room with deans, provosts and presidents and I just wanna just scream um, because it's just this, it, yeah, it, yeah, it is. Cool, thank you for that. Thank you all. Um, yeah. I, I hope that we'll be able to, we're gonna be able to share some things with you to sort of give you hopefully some some ways to kind of think about some of this stuff. Thank you. I think that is, Alexander, you had a question, you had a comment or a question? No, I just have a comment. <clears throat> and I understand what we're talking about as far as programs and services, but I don't want us to miss the important factor of people, and especially people of color with intersecting identities. Mm -hmm. And I'm advocating if you're on a college campus for academic advisors, we have become social workers, 
mental well-being, mm -hmm. food insecurity, housing insecurity. We advise a large student caseload, but we're not taking into consideration sometimes how people of color and those with intersecting identities are showing up in spaces that people don't seem to be concerned about and how they're using their resistance and navigational campus to come to work eight hours a day. So I don't want us to miss the people aspect. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned that because the emotional labor that's happening now on college campuses among student affairs professionals, academic advisors, faculty of color, and people from marginalized identities needs to be underlined um, because that is that is the unsaid. It's that, oh, you know, so all of this is happening in our world and our country. And then who are the people who are of support when this is happening? And what is the toll that, that it's taking on them? And let's be clear, they are not being compensated for other duties as assigned. Um, and that has been a history of higher education. And we need to we need to make sure that we name it. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, thank you. Totally, totally, totally with you. Yeah, absolutely. And and how do we how how do we take care of that community and folks too? Right, like how is there a culture of care then that's been that is being built to recognize the importance of that work? Because without that work, then our students aren't getting the support they need to to thrive in college, to find a community, and then they're they're gone. Right, like they're not going to make it on a college campus when they can't figure out how to how to get housing, how to how to find food, right? And so how do we make sure that uh, we are really understanding that it is much more than what we what people had signed up to do in their everyday jobs, right? Because the needs are there from students um, directly and and how do we put that at the center? Yeah, I remember I used to always tell people that um, in any position I ever held, um, on a college campus, I was always, there was always an and in the middle of my title. So I was always, like at Iowa State University, I was assistant dean of students and director of multicultural affairs. Even though I didn't get paid to be director of multicultural affairs, being who I am in the world and how I present, I was also and director of multicultural affairs. When I was an RD in a hall, I was the resident director and director of multicultural affairs. So it's really important for us to honor and name that. Absolutely. 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 When I think so much of this as we're talking about it is how, how are we navigating this, right? Knowing that these are the, the present realities that we're facing. And, you know, like Vernon said, yes, they might have been, these things may have happened before at other times, but we weren't in these, you may not have been in that place in time before, right? So I can see that headline that Vernon put up from 1968 and be like, that's great, but I wasn't there in 1968, right? So it is new to me. Um, it is new to those of us who are experiencing it in this moment. And even if I've experienced something like it, I ha haven't experienced it with those people that I'm with right then and, and now, right? So going back to what we're talking about too, with the community piece, right? Experiencing something with one group of folks is different than experiencing with a di with different group of folks. And so how do we begin to navigate that um, and, and understand that so we can keep these conversations moving forward, which I think is what the overall intention is, right? Vernon, like, we don't want to stop. We don't, we want to recognize that these conversations need to continue because they are better for the entire community. Re whatever race you are entering with, whatever identities you carry, it's, it is better for all of us when we are having these conversations. And so with that, as we think about that, um, some of the things that have grounded our um, our philosophy is that this kind of pressure, obviously we've said it, it's not new um, in the historical context, but it's, it is new for those of us that are experiencing it, right? And maybe for the first time, right? Or maybe for the first time in this role as your director of student activities. Um, and then along the same lines of things that we've recognized, and, and we all just mentioned it, the constant change and threat to DI work is exhausting, exhausting, exhausting and burdensome, specifically to uh, student affairs professionals and uh, people from marginalized identities, right? And how do we recognize that? How do people with privileged identities also recognize that, right? And so it's not just a um, that, that we're all working with that understanding um, and then knowing that this, uh, this work is, is a necessity. Um, we have to keep doing this work. 
So the work, the philosophy that we've taken at Leadership as we approach this work is we're always looking to co-create a liberatory space for all who engage in our programs, right? That co-creation of space, as we talk about the, doing this work, allows students to show up in the in the ways that are most true and authentic to them and allows us then as professionals to hopefully also do the same, recognizing that I may be limited by whatever the politics are of my campus, whatever the fear may be that's going on, recognizing all of that, but always working to co-create that. Because what we're seeing, and, and Vernon, jump in here if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but I, I think this is how we've kind of been talking about it, is that when students are driving these conversations, they can continue. The, it is not coming under scrutiny when students are bringing up these co conversations and they are co-creating that space. What is coming under scrutiny is that though that the work of DEI is being imposed upon others who don't want to have the conversation. So let students have the conversation. Let them guide that, hold that container for them and hold them with care so that they can continue on in those conversations. Absolutely, Chris. And I, I know that I used to think and I'll, you know, I'll say this, I don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but sometimes I think we're doing work from 1992, um, DEI work from 1992, because you did a program in 1992 that really impacted students, and you're going to keep doing it, stop doing it. The students from 1992 are not the students in, two, in 2023, stop doing it. Because I remember there used to be a time when I would put up a slide and say, this is the definition of racism. This is the definition of homophobia. This is the definition of heterosexism. Thank you. Good night. Nope. Now it's about tell me a story about who you are in the world. And then we make meaning of it. I know the concepts already. I don't need to tell people. I don't need to tell. I don't need to show off that I know theories around um, liberatory um, justice. I don't need to. I don't need. I don't need to show off. I just need to be there to be the container to hold the student conversation, knowing that I know the concepts and I can move them in a direction that allows them to grow and learn. That's the key. It really is important. And I'm so glad that that we're talking about this um, because less is more when it comes to slides. I really believe it is about the conversation because the empathy that can happen among privileged and, mon and mon minoritized groups is through storytelling, is through lived experience, is through making meaning of the concepts that we all know. Um, and so what does that look like for you as you're developing programs and services. And really, it makes me think about how, how are we letting go of some of the control of those conversations, right? Very often, because of the roles that we have, the titles that we have, we are asked to be seen as the experts in the space and not to negate the importance of us each doing our own work. So Vernon, you mentioned, you know, understanding theories of liberation. Yeah, I should know that. That That's part of my job. That's part of what I I need to, to understand, absolutely, but I'm not constantly teaching that. I'm using that framework to then guide my work. I'm using that framework to guide the spaces that I'm creating for students to have their conversations. And along the way, I'm letting go of a little bit of control of that and letting students tell me where they want to have the conversation, what is meaningful and important to them, um, and not trying to impose then my particular viewpoint or what I think is important in, in their conversation, right? And and not getting hung up on the lingo or the vocabulary. Because when you look through a lot of the, the threats that are coming and the legislation that's coming, a lot of it is specifically about vocabulary, right? These words, those words, don't use this theory, don't say this. But when we get down to what the core of those concepts are, we're already teaching those in our classrooms. We're teaching about community. We're teaching about mattering. We're teaching about our values. So continue to teach on those with at the at the core of what we're of what we're talking about. Yeah, I was I always say that the the whole um um assault on um critical race theory was comical to me. I've never used that I've never used that term in a session ever in my entire life. I'm like, what? I'm like, now I don't mean to I'm not in any way dismissing the intensity of that um of that resistance, but I'm going, oh wait, you're missing the point. Um, okay, so I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to use that word. Cool. But trust me, critical race theory is in my being. Well, I always say failure is not the opposite of success. It's a part of it. Oh, okay. That's a little Deion Sanders, I believe. If I've been watching some TikToks as well. <laughs> that's, just, 
<laughs> That's perfect timing. <laughs> um, yeah, it is about taking kind of what you're saying, Vernon. Right? It's, about, it's about us as professionals now. We're being asked to now, given what is happening, to take the theories and things that we know and teach them in a different manner, right? And not just rely on, let me share this theory with you. Let me say this is how it's grounded. Do that. We Yes, we need to continue doing that work. So this is, again, it, it is continued labor on, on our parts. Absolutely. Um, and that is exhausting and wearisome. But at the same time, we're trying to then have the conversation. We can have a conversation about critical race theory without saying that that's what it is and still engaging in that conversation. Uh, we we do that here in our programs very often. Tell us about what's important to you and why, right? Oh, he, the, what's important to me is, is my identity as a female. Oh, why is that important to you, right? Like I didn't, I didn't lead that conversation anywhere. That just is started by the students, right? And so um, how do we begin to, to see that as important? Yeah, and Kristen, I'm thinking about, we need to see it as evolution because this work has been evolving since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, and we use, language has been evolving. The way that we engage has been evolving. And this is a part of the evolution now. We've got a context in our country and our world right now that uh, that asks that basically is saying we need something different. Our right. students are saying it too because if now let's be clear, every study that's come out about affirmative action, overwhelmingly, students of color and students um, who are for privileged identities all say we don't really believe affirmative action is working. From since the 1970s to now, that number has not changed much. People have said, we don't like it. Right. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't, it, we sometimes interpret that as we don't like diverse communities. No, nobody said that. Right. But the very narrow practice of affirmative action has not really sat well with Black folk, people of color, uh, because we all know that the people who uh, who benefited the most from affirmative action have been white women. Now, let's be clear, that has been... That, that has always been in, in, in every research, always talked about. So we've always kind of had this sort of love-hate relationship with affirmative action. And over the years, we've sort of navigated around it. But, the, but what I want to say is it's not really about that one piece. It's about the intended outcome. We want diverse communities because we know that we grow and learn because of that. How we get there may, has changed over the last 20 to 30 years. And, right. and it needs to continue changing to to continue that work, right? That that needs to continue changing, and it makes me think too. I was I was listening to a, a podcast, which I don't I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts. Sometimes you'd hear other leadership staff talk about how many podcasts they listen to, but I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was about um, Alabama Rush TikTok. Just in case you are were a fan, a follower of that this fall. But um, as I listened to that, it, I heard. The conversation was talking about fraternity and sorority life and um, talking specifically about the whiteness of this TikTok thread and, and what that looks like. And, and I was like, I had paused for a minute and I was like, that's right. These conversations about identity are showing up in other spaces where we wouldn't have expected it. I did not expect, as I was listening to this podcast about Rush, I did not expect to also have a conversation about identity and whiteness at the same time. But I have to remember that that's how that's that is the world I'm live, that I live in right now, and I'm glad that that is the place where people can see that those things are connected. And then it just makes me question: then when I'm teaching about DEI work, do, do I also recognize that? And am I allowing for that those natural conversations which are happening around us more and more frequently? Which in my generational growing up, my own bias, it did not happen. That is not the case for other folks. And so how do we recognize potentially some of our own biases it, within the work that we're doing as we're showing up as the people presenting those programs, designing those programs um, to, to recognize that this is this is different, right? And I need to take the, the ownership and the, do the work to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we keep talking, I hope this has been helpful. And I think, you know, Jonathan, you kind of mentioned that a little bit in your comments too, right? Of, you know, recognizing how we learned as facilitators and recognizing that that also needs to change as our students change, as our audiences change, as just more information is known, right? There are things that 
We didn't know about identity development 15 or 20 years ago that now we know. Thank you to the researchers and the great people who are doing that work. And so how do we continue to grow and learn with that? We wanted to give you um, an opportunity as we sort of move to near the end of our experience, just to kind of feel free um, if you want to respond to some of these in um, the chat um, or, or any reflections on these. But what we found is when we do these, um, these conversations, there's been a really good opportunity for folks to um, use a slide like this as um, a professional development opportunity for your staff um, in order to basically say, um, and we found that folks have in these conversations, the facilitators have shared questions that we've heard folks have taken to their staffs and their communities to have deeper conversations about this topic. And so some of the things we'd like to offer to you is, you know, what is the role um, what is um, what role is fear playing in the approach we are taking to DEI work? I saw a couple of comments earlier around, um, and I've seen it too. Um, senior leaders on college campuses don't want any attention placed on their institution, so there's this hesitancy. I've seen it in my work. Um, those of us who do this work in consulting, we have seen a dip in um, being asked to come to campus because we're not gonna bring Vernon Wall on campus because people will know what he's gonna be talking about. And so what I'm telling folks is we should be doing the opposite. We should be stating our commitment to this work and that we will continue to do things um, in ways that will be respected and connected to all students. Um, that's, that's, that's what we always do. And it can't be one statement, Lord have mercy. If I see, if I see another campus do one big statement about what they value, and then nothing else, I'm like, no, that's not how you do statements. What you do is you do a statement three times a semester. And in those statements, you say, here's what we've done since the last statement that has moved our campus toward a more equity. Those, those statements should be coming out three times a semester at least, and just letting folks know what we're doing. Um, how do you prioritize safety and still reach um, the educational outcomes necessary for this work? I know sometimes that term safety kind of lands on people in different ways. I believe what, what we are saying at Leadership is that allowing for there to be an opportunity for people to feel that they can contribute, whatever that is for them. There's different levels of, of and, and we don't know that, but how can we provide, as we said, a container for folks to really engage? And then <clears throat> I, um, I love to, I love to, to challenge folks around um, listening very closely to critique um, specifically because most critique that we get and resistance has a sliver of truth in it, but we don't hear it because we're so frustrated with the critique and with the resistance. But what I typically do is listen very closely for a sliver of truth. I had someone in a session one time come up to me and say, Vernon, I don't, I don't mind having these conversations about equity and inclusion, but anytime I'm in them, I always feel that I'm being blamed as a white person because it's my fault. And part of me wants to go, well, it is kind of a little bit your fault, but you know, okay, fine. But the reality is it's, it's nobody's fault. It's we all have responsibility. So I always listen, that little piece of critique is like, sometimes as a, as a cisgender man in the world, I sometimes wonder how can I even make a difference in sexism? What can I do? And I feel sometimes that that women look at me and say, you're the problem. And I have to own it and go, well, you know what? I am kind of part of the problem. Not me as an individual necessarily, but my group, my group membership as a cisgender man, I'm a part of that. And so I join you in your critique because I sometimes feel that way as a man. We've got to listen closely. Once you join, the conversation, the conversation moves more toward humanity in a conversation than it is to a debate or who's right, who's wrong. And then how do we separate rhetoric from, um, from information and experiences? Kristen did that so well earlier in terms of talking about how do we allow for stories to be shared? How do we allow for there to be, how do we allow for it to be participant driven conversations rather than facilitator driven conversations? Um, I'm there to be the container to hold and navigate it. And maybe every now and then throw in something that maybe will move the group in a, in a direction. 
but I don't have to be the, the center of it. And I think that that's important. When we talk about reframing, and I know that um, there's a, I know there's a little bit of hesitancy around, um, I was talking to some people who've been doing this work for a while on their campus, um, specifically a person who was a director of a DEI office. And she said, what she's finding is that she's been around for a while in the profession. And so she knows that she's, re she's reframed um, th their office of multicultural affairs to equity inclusion to social, I mean, it's been changed so many times. She says, I don't even remember what the name used to be of our office, but they were constant reframing. And she said, but what she's noticing is that people who are younger professionals on our campus are the most frustrated. They're like, how, in the, how, why should we have to change because we're doing great work? And, and so she's trying to find that balance of supporting younger professionals who are frustrated and angry and basically saying, and that's kind of the work of equity and inclusion. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna have resistance. It's not a movement unless you have resistance. So resistance is energy. Resistance allows us to get better. And so I would encourage us to think of ways in which we can use terminology like empathy, belonging, community, identity. Power and privilege can still be shared when we do it in a way of thinking about all of us. So in other words, I have identities that receive privileges. I talk about those all the time when I do presentations, which is always interesting because nobody thinks I'm gonna talk about that. Because the way I present, people are, are thinking, I believe that I'm going to speak through my marginalized lenses throughout my entire presentation. And, and I, I blow their minds when I do the exact opposite. I will throw in several examples about me and Christian privilege. I will throw in some examples about me being a cisgender male in the world. And I will also throw in some stories about being a black man navigating the world today, all together. So that allows for people to see wholeness in, in all of us. And so think about our students in terms of the ways in which they end it. And then connectedness. These are all things that no one can look at this and say, we don't want you to talk about this to our students. Now, the thing about power and privilege is typically people don't wanna own that privilege. It's like, I'm an individual. I'm doing great in the world. So I wanna be seen as an individual. And it's important for us to help people realize that we are individuals and we also are members of groups. And those groups sometimes receive privileges, sometimes um, are marginalized. And privilege does not equal bad. Privilege equals opportunity. It's what you do with that privilege that allows for us to really and truly change the world. That's it. And do you want to see what, so I'm starting to lose my, lose my voice again, but do we want to see what questions people have as we have a little bit, a couple of minutes left or, or thoughts or comments that people have as we, we, Jordan and I have shared a lot of information and thoughts with you. Absolutely. Folks, I mean, people, we, we've got a pretty intimate group. So if people want to unmute um, and, you know, raise your hand if you like, or any, any comments, reactions, thoughts, um, as you think about, um, you know, continuing to do this work. As you can tell, I'm catching up on comments. That and way. I was looking at some of the comments. What I, oh, fuck, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for giving us an opportunity to kind of, well, not kind of, to have this conversation um, as somebody who works in a social justice space, um, especially as a cisgender white guy who works in a social justice space. Um, I oftentimes kind of have all these things going in my head and I think, am I the only person that thinks this or am I the only person that thinks that? Um, and so it's been great to hear, you know, some of these things because some of these are things that I worry about and I wonder about, but then I also wonder, am I the only one? Um, and so it's nice to be able to put that in a, a bigger context of a movement. Um, and I really uh, appreciate that opportunity. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. And, I, and I'm glad. And 
And I hope we do kind of remember that there are other people out there having these kind of thoughts and in, in, in conversations. And that is also one of the ways that we can keep this work in diversity, equity, inclusion moving forward is that we don't shy away from those conversations, right? And that so much of the systems that are at play are going to try to shut us down from having those conversations. And that's, you know, Vernon, you mentioned that in that resistance is energy. And I think always reminding ourselves that there is that energy there, right? And so using that energy and not letting it stop us, right, is is really important. Alexander, you had your hand up too. Uh, yes, uh, Vernon, thank you for bringing into the conversation young professionals. And what, this is just my perspective, what I think is missing in grad school as these young professionals come in with all these theoretical foundations, but in the curriculum, they're getting two or three social justice uh, courses. And I don't know about y'all, I only have a multicultural course. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in with different expectations, like you said. We're using language like uh, bring your authentic self, bring your whole self to the space. But when they're bringing their authentic selves and whole selves to the space, they're being uh, still disenfranchised and marginalized. So it's good for us to have this conversation with professionals, but how are we connecting with schools that have graduate programs in student affairs to help those young people make the transition? Because what I'm seeing on a lot of campuses, especially with cultural centers, they're hiring a lot of people based on their identity. So it becomes tokenism for me. And then they become martyrs because they don't know how to run those spaces in mm -hmm. higher ed. Absolutely. Oh, so much in there. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that what I'm noticing, and it's so funny, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I just realized that I said this in the, so in the SJTI um, webinar that we just did. We talked about this. We talked about the fact that there are so many people in our profession of student affairs specifically and in, and in nonprofits specifically that work on social justice concerns. Um, we know the language and we know the theories and we can, we love to share those, we do, but it's not about only knowing the language and the theories of equity and inclusion and social justice. It's about being. It's about your lived experience. And what I'm finding is that many long, young professionals tend to be about doing social justice work rather than about being about social justice work. And just because you are from a specific identity doesn't mean you know. So we all have personal work to do. And so how can we then set up there as a dynamic of learning among all of us? We're all teachers and learners. Um, but I agree with you that I think folks come in thinking that we have the tools and the skills because we have the theories to do the work, but that's not, that's not all. It's, it is about how do we then show up in our fullness? What does it look like for us to be human um, and, to, and, to, and to share um, stories of our struggles? in our, not only our marginalized, but our privileged identities. I, I'm missing that. I'm, I'm joining you in that I see this sort of, um, this expert um, energy around, I'm, I know the best that needs to happen in this space. And I also see um, folks burning out quickly because they're not getting the support. Um, I always say, <laughs> the, worst, the worst position to be in, I think on a college campus is a, is a um, senior DEI um, person on your campus or in your organization, because they typically, number one, are not, if you ever see a job description for a senior diversity officer, um, I would say that no one can do, one, no one person can do all of that, um, number one. And number two, they don't get the resources in order to do the work that they need to do. And number three, the supervisor, president, or CEO has no idea what that position should do. So they're being set up for failure. They're being set up for failure, every last one of them. There are a few, that I believe are doing great work on their college campus, but the, and you can go to the Nottahe website and you can see the latest um, survey um, that talked about um, DEI work on college campuses, interviewing DEI professionals, and you will see some very interesting themes around that work. So totally join you on that. 
it makes me think too, and Arthur brings up a great point in the comments too, of like a lot of our new professionals did their graduate work during COVID. And so they missed that in-person experience in their assistantships and in their in their training that as you think about people who did not do graduate assistantships during the COVID times, you you had that person-to-person -person interaction and you had that learning that happened right mm -hmm. there in front of you and you were able to process that. So it does make me think then as people who are supervising new professionals, how are we rebuilding support structures around those professionals so that they don't burn out so easily, right? That we also have to recognize that we can make a change in, in certain parts of the way we support students and in parts of our structure of, okay, so if we're seeing that they're not getting what they need, what do we need to change within our systems to support them in that? Because we do still want them in that work. We need people in this work. Um, and it can't just be something that turns and burns people through and we just wait for the next available person. But how are we really reframing then what support is needed and um, how do we advocate for that? How do we look for that in other programs as well, right? So that it doesn't always rely on the diversity, equity, inclusion office to be talking about these things, right? That how are we talking about it in leadership? How are we talking about it in advising? How are we talking about it in all the areas so that it is taking into account the whole person and that wholeness that we talked about? Absolutely, Kristen. And I would say the last resource I'll give folks is um, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn is really doing some outstanding work now on belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a new book coming out. And I would say if you need a good text to reframe the work that you're doing in a way that faculty, staff, and critics, listen to me closely, and critics can have no, no ammunition to stop you, use Terrell Strayhorn's work because it is brilliant. He did this way before, he started this before the pandemic. So he must have had a crystal ball and knew something was happening. It's great work that really engages folks and allows folks to say, we're doing this work because we want students, all students on our campus to feel connected in community. There is no way anybody can develop any legislation against that. And it's brilliant. Yes. And yes. I can, I, I will try to find, hold on. I'll try to find a link real quick while we're wrapping up. Okay. You try to find that link. And I see we have a couple questions still. Vernon and I will stay on in a couple minutes and chat if you have a little bit of time. Um, but I do want to recognize it's been an hour. So thank you all for, for joining us in this conversation. We could continue on talking for more hours and uh, hope to do that with you all because that is this is this is such an important part of the work that we're doing on college campuses with with your help and assistance. And thank you, Abby, is putting in the link in all the links in the chat for all of our announcements. Uh, so if you want to learn a little bit more about tomorrow's session and possibility thinking, the link is there for you. Um, please come back and join us tomorrow. I think it I think it will mirror, pair, pair nicely with the kind of the way we've had this conversation today and what does possibility thinking mean to us. Um, and so, yeah, also check out the Leadership Merchandise while you're there on our website. And if you really want to engage deeper in this conversation about identity, I really encourage you to check out the NCLP website. We are hosting co-hosting with them a Leadership Educator Symposium. We will be talking about liberatory learning and leadership education. Um, and a lot of what we've talked about here today will be things that we talk about and dive deeper into during that symposium. So, Thank you all so much for your time this afternoon. And um, Vernon and I will stay around a few minutes if you have any questions. <laughs>